Isaiah is a prophet's prophet. He's quoted more than any other prophet in the scriptures. The Savior quoted him extensively in the New Testament, and you probably already know how much the Book of Mormon quotes Isaiah. But Isaiah is also difficult to understand and takes a little more work to find the meaning. However, there are a few simple helps to understand Isaiah that can be found in the scriptures, especially from Nephi, who was an Isaiah superfan. In 2 Nephi 25, Nephi gives four tips on how to get more out of your study of Isaiah. Let's go over the four tips, and then we'll take them out for a test drive on a passage in Isaiah. First, Nephi says people sometimes struggle with Isaiah because they know not concerning the manner of prophesying among the Jews. The manner of prophesying among the Jews is very different from the way prophets work among us today. Most prophets in our time are fairly straightforward about what they're talking about. They'll explain an idea, and then they'll lay it out point by point. Isaiah and most of the Old Testament prophets didn't operate this way. They would use rich symbolism and metaphors to explain things. They were almost never straightforward about what they were talking about and wrote in poetry. For instance, Isaiah wrote in poetry. You can actually find versions of Isaiah where the poetic stanzas are preserved. Second, Nephi says the meaning of Isaiah's writings are plain unto all those that are filled with the spirit of prophecy. What is the spirit of prophecy? Revelation 19 verse 10 tells us that the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. So when you read Isaiah, you should be looking for Jesus. You should be making connections and insights into the Savior's life. Nephi also said when he wanted to more fully persuade his family to believe in the Lord their Redeemer, he did read unto them that which was written by the prophet Isaiah. So look for Christ while you study Isaiah. Third, Nephi says it was easier for him to understand Isaiah because he knew concerning Jerusalem and the regions round about. It helps if you know a little Holy Land geography and also a little about the geopolitical situation in Isaiah's day. Isaiah acted as an advisor to the king of Judah. Judah was a tiny little kingdom sandwiched between two big superpowers, Assyria in the north and Egypt in the south. But most of the Bible takes place in a little stretch of land where three continents, Africa, Asia, and Europe all meet. Living at this crossroad of empires meant that the children of Israel were always in a bit of a precarious position. Finally, Nephi says that the prophecies of Isaiah shall be of great worth unto them in the last days, for in that day they shall understand them. Many of Isaiah's prophecies are about the latter days and will become clearer as we approach the time of the Savior's second coming. Let's apply some of Nephi's advice to some of the early passages in Isaiah just to see how things work. If you're using a Latter-day Saint Bible, the chapter headings also provide some great clues about what time period Isaiah is talking about, whether it's Isaiah's time, the time of the Savior's ministry, or the latter days. The chapter heading to Isaiah 2 mentions the latter-day temple, the gathering of Israel, and the millennial judgment and peace. So we know right at the start that this is a prophecy about the latter days, and we can read this passage with that lens. A quick scan of the chapter also shows a lot of mentions about mountains and hills, so it might be helpful to know a little bit about the geography of Isaiah's homeland, the land of Jerusalem as well. First, the landscape around Jerusalem is pretty dramatic. Jerusalem is a mountain fortress built on a series of hills in Judea to protect it from invading armies. It's also in a dramatic spot. Less than an hour away from Jerusalem is Jericho and the Dead Sea, the lowest place on earth. Any approach to Jerusalem means you'll be traveling uphill to the tops of the mountains. If you look at one of the maps in your study helps in your scriptures, it shows how dramatic the rise is to get to Jerusalem where the Lord's house was found. The first time I visited Jerusalem, I was surprised to see that it was in the tops of the mountains. All nations flowing under this point could have reference to the location of Jerusalem at the crossroad between all these huge empires like Assyria, Egypt, Babylon, and Persia. On one level, Isaiah is talking about the glory of the old Jerusalem being restored when the Savior returns. But like most of Isaiah's prophecies, this passage could be read on multiple levels. Is there another place in the world where a temple's been built at a crossroads found in the tops of the mountains? The saints found themselves driven from place to place until finally they found a new home in the top of the Rocky Mountains. All nations flowing under the Latter-day Saint Temple finds fulfillment in the thousands of people who gather to the inner mountain west to be near the temple. 
Many more still gather for general conferences held at church headquarters where they're taught by modern prophets. Some even interpreted the Olympics, which literally brought visitors from all nations as a fulfillment of Isaiah's prophecy. Just like this passage, we can find deeper meaning in the prophecies of Isaiah with just a few simple steps. Examining Isaiah with an eye to the latter days, particularly with a focus on the Savior, can help us not only understand how Jesus saves us, but also why there is a reason for hope for those who live in the latter days.